Okay, so uh, uh, you know, here's the finite difference method. We got one implicit method, the Crank Nicholson. We got uh, three now explicit methods. Um, there's the Euler, the Leapfrog, and the Dufort Frankel. And here's the stability criteria for both. Uh, this third column is the stability criteria for the heat flow equation. And here's the stability criteria for the uh, uh, for the 15 degree extrapolator, and I, and I give you the equations up here. Okay, and uh, here's the coefficients. Uh, you know, with the uh, the value of alpha, the alpha constant, which is the last one you've seen, right? So not not easy to find. Sorry about that. I should have written down the alpha here. Um, but uh, uh, that's uh, um, that's where we're where we're at. Um, you know, you see that the simple Euler difference, you know, it can work for heat flow, and, and we've got this instructive um, uh, stability criterion, um, which means that we can't, uh, you know, we can't predict heat flow necessarily from one day to the next, but probably from one second to the next. And then, um, uh, you know, in terms of the wave, the the wave extrapolator. You know, none of the uh, uh, explicit methods that Clairbout tried really were useful, although you can make a st uh, leapfrog stability criterion. Uh, and that's why Clairbout went to the default. Uh, I'm sorry, that's why Clairbout went to the implicit Crank Nicholson that requires that uh, uh, kind of weird uh, tridiagonal matrix solver. Uh, that, and you'll see that, uh, you'll see that in, in, uh, in Lab 7 and 8. Um, but now we also have this Dufort Frankel explicit method, which is unconditionally stable uh, for uh, all uh, all the all these uh, equations. Okay. Now, when we uh, um, when we go forward, I'll probably uh, there will probably be a lecture uh, recorded about uh, time domain extrapolation. You know, this is this fifteen degree uh, equation here is in omega, right? Or omega prime, uh, so uh, you know it's it's in the uh, in the uh, retarded frequency domain, right? So um, uh, you know we we've got different equations and different finite difference schemes if we if we have you know x z and t, okay, all finite differenced, uh, and and we'll we'll find a you know a different way of testing the stability of uh, of that. Um, Testing the stability of, of uh, those calculations, and we will in fact find an unconditionally stable way of doing that uh, time domain extrapolation too. Um, oh, here is the time domain way of extrapolation. Sorry. Um, so let me uh, uh, now that we've examined the stability, okay, let's uh, of of the frequency domain way of extrapolation. Let's let's go into the time domain way of extrapolation. I have a little time to just introduce it, and uh, we'll continue with it on uh, in my. Uh, I'll, I'll continue with it in my in my on in my uh, lecture that I'll record for tomorrow because we're going to go see Bray's talk, and then uh, and then uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll have a further lecture on Friday here. Okay, so. Uh, I am uh, now in notes 26 on page 115. Uh, we've finished our look at the heat flow equation and its finite difference schemes and the 15 degree extrapolator in the frequency domain, in the omega domain, and its finite difference schemes. Uh, we have a good variety of effective methods available to us. Uh, and uh, it's time to take the bull by the horns and, and actually uh, just do everything in in the time and space domain. You know, forget this this frequency stuff. Um, you know, we I, I want to finally show you how uh, you know effectively a three D convolution is uh, is wave propagation. So this is finally going to be you know time and space domain multi dimensional convolution being uh, wave propagation. You know, being that kind of filtering being used to solve a physical problem. Okay, 
So here's our 15 degree retarded extrapolation equation. You know, we're, we're keeping it a re, you know, retarded time uh, for convenience. There's, there's these two, these two uh, 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 terms that we have to find a difference. And one is kind of weird. We have uh, d squared q dz dt, right? And then minus v over 2. And then this is our good old you know, d squared q dx squared. Okay, We know about that. Uh, I'm going to define the way Clayton did. Clayton is was my advisor, and his advisor was Clairbout. So uh, Clayton kind of expanded on what's in the book in this way. Um, we need to look at the accuracy of uh, a bit more of our of our finite difference operators. Okay, our, and and these operators, you know, we have some function in some axis zeta, which we uh, difference. Along that uh, along that axis zeta, and we're going to difference it in the forward sense, and so that that's okay. So that's a lot of notation. Okay, that's that's an appro you know, and of course what we're trying to do is get an approximation for the zeta direction partial derivative, right? Uh, df d zeta, right? So. Um, um, uh, if you and, and yeah, it's a little confusing the way that I wrote it here, but but uh, bear with me. All right, so the the difference operator. Let's define that d plus zeta as the function f at zeta plus delta zeta minus the function f at zeta divided by delta zeta. Okay. Now, if you add, you know, so that's going to be an approximation to the derivative df d zeta. Okay. If you add terms of order, okay, that's, this is a capital O here, terms of order delta zeta, then you will get, then you will be equal to the actual derivative. Okay, so we have our finite difference, and then we got to add or subtract something, and then we'll be, we'll have our, our actual derivative. Okay, and so what we're interested in figuring out is how accurate is this? What are the, you know, if, if this is, uh, if these terms are of order, you know, ten times delta zeta, then you know we're we're hung out to dry. We you know we can't proceed. It's not accurate enough to do anything with. Okay, so let's check the accuracy. Okay, let's you know why why is this true? This this is a fact. Why is this true? All right. So what we can do is we can take f at zeta plus delta zeta, and we can expand it in a Taylor series about uh, delta zeta equal to zero. Okay, so uh, uh, here is the definition of uh, you know d plus uh, relative to zeta, big D plus. Okay, and um, here's the Taylor series, right? There's that's f at zeta, and this is uh, this is uh, delta zeta here, right? In the definition, but then that that uh, from the from the definition f at zeta plus delta zeta, right? That's expanded to the Taylor series. So that's equal to the you know expanding that uh, f at zeta plus delta zeta is f at zeta plus f prime right d which is df d zeta right f prime uh, uh, at zeta times delta zeta plus one half f double prime right d squared f d zeta squared at zeta times delta zeta squared and and then more terms at higher levels of uh, you know higher exponents of delta zeta and higher order uh, uh, derivatives. So, uh, but notice here that you, you make that expansion, then you can subtract, right? You can subtract uh, f at zeta, right? There's f at zeta. Subtract f at zeta. Divide all the terms that are left by delta zeta. What do you got left? Okay. So what you have is that the <clears throat> the uh, um, uh, the finite difference. Okay, the simple forward difference, you know, sec uh, first order, the first order difference, uh, d plus at, uh, along zeta of f at zeta is equal to f prime at zeta. Right, that's what we wanted. Right, we want we want the difference to be equal to the derivative. If it stopped there, that would be perfect. Right, we would be perfectly accurate. If it stopped, if it stopped right here, but then there's more terms. Okay. Plus, you know, taking from here, one half f double prime uh, at uh, zeta times delta zeta. Right? Remember, we divided out a delta zeta here. Uh, plus more terms of order, you know, the highest order uh, delta zeta squared. Right? 
So the, uh, the d plus operator gives the derivative plus these terms whose highest order is delta zeta, and thus my statement here okay, about uh, the difference being equal to the, uh, equal to the, uh, uh, the derivative after you add some things. Okay? And it's important to know what's the order. Now, we also have a backwards difference operator, call it d minus, which is f at zeta minus f at zeta minus delta zeta all over delta zeta. right? And we could go through the same process and show that, likewise, this, this uh, is equal to the derivative plus uh, terms of order uh, delta zeta again. Okay? So now we can define, uh, you know, using this new notation, right, that we understand maybe more about how accurate it is. Using this new notation, we're going to um, we're going to make this uh, uh, we're going to make up our second uh, difference, right? D zeta squared, right, of f is we're going to first apply d minus to f, then we're going to apply d plus, uh, and we get the same thing if we apply d plus first and then d minus, right? These are right associative uh, operators. So here is uh, applying d plus, okay? And so it's f at zeta plus delta zeta minus f at zeta over delta zeta, and then we apply d minus to that, and so we have uh, one over delta zeta times the quantity f at zeta plus delta zeta minus f at zeta over delta zeta minus f at zeta minus f at zeta minus delta zeta over delta zeta, and of course we rearrange that it it comes out being just exactly what we're familiar with, right? That's what we saw before. d zeta squared is uh, f at zeta plus delta zeta minus 2 f at zeta plus f at zeta minus delta zeta over all over delta zeta squared. Okay. Now, how accurate is this d, big D squared? Okay. So again, we have the same Taylor series expansion about uh, delta zeta equal, equals 0. Right? We've got to expand f at zeta plus delta zeta. We've got to expand f at zeta minus delta zeta. So here's the expansion of uh, f at uh, uh, zeta plus delta zeta, right? The expansion of f at, at zeta uh, minus delta zeta, okay? And you know there's the f primes in there. You can see they're canceling out the f double primes. That's what we want, right? We find out, lo and behold, that we have um, our our second difference, d sub zeta squared, of applied to any function f. Is the second derivative f double prime right? Again, if we could stop there, we'd be perfectly accurate. Plus one twelfth. Okay, this uh, f super iv right? That's a Roman numeral four, so that's f. Uh, uh, that's the fourth derivative of f. Okay, times delta zeta squared. All right, and there's more terms too, but that's the that's the largest term, right? Remember, delta zeta is small, right? So so um, you know, delta zeta squared is smaller than delta zeta. So um, uh, you know, the the uh, second difference gives us the second derivative plus this term, you know, of order delta zeta squared. Okay, and that's why you know it's equal to f double prime plus uh, terms of order delta zeta squared. And, and since delta zeta is small, right, our, this is why our second difference is more accurate than our first difference. Because our first difference, if you remember, was, was you know, uh, had, had error terms on, of the order of delta zeta. But the second difference has, has error terms of order delta zeta squared. OK. Uh, all right. So, so that's. Uh, um, that's an essential explanation of the accuracy and, and how you get it. You know, whatever your finite difference scheme is, right? You know, here we have this complicated finite difference scheme. You know, whatever it may be, uh, you know, Dufort Frankel or whatever, you can do these Taylor expansions and you can get the accuracy, the level of accuracy, the, the order of accuracy of your um, of your of your finite difference. And I think uh, before I go into page 117, this is where I where I should stop. Okay, so we are in um, notes number 26. Um, we are talking about uh, the accuracy and stability of finite difference uh, methods that we've uh, been looking at and um, developing a new all physical domain, all time domain 
method, not having to Fourier transform the data to uh, the omega domain first. We're on uh, page uh, 117, and we have just been uh, looking at the uh, accuracy of the uh, big D2 operator. Um, the uh, the second difference uh, uh, also uh, second order, and um, as you might suspect, it's possible to form the operation of the uh, of the second difference operator across in X. It's possible to form that into a tridiagonal equation system uh, with using a tridiagonal matrix uh, over here. Uh, and the center diagonal of the, of the tridiagonal matrix is uh, minus two. The side diagonals are one, right? And then uh, we multiply it by the row in x uh, here, just represented by the the function uh, instead of in x, uh, more generally in zeta. So we have f at uh, x equal to uh, zero, f at x equals to uh, delta zeta, f at x equal to two delta zeta, and so forth, up to n times delta zeta, and uh, that produces the uh, uh, this matrix multiplication, which is a, a kind of convolution actually, produces the same thing uh, as the application of the uh, uh, the second difference operator in zeta on the function f, uh, which is an approximation, as you know, to the second derivative of f with respect to zeta, d squared f d zeta squared. So um, our matrix equation is just the tri tridiagonal matrix, uh, T, with two lines under it, times the column vector f. And that that's the same thing, same operator, uh, same effect as uh, the second difference in, uh, uh, of f. So now uh, we can absorb that into the finite differencing of our 15-degree uh, uh, retarded wave equation. So we have uh, d squared q dz dt is equal to minus v over 2 times d squared q dx squared. So uh, we know how to do the uh, d squared q dx squared. That's just uh, applying the, uh, the big D squared uh, in x to, uh, to q you know, along the x vectors. And uh, we, we now know that that uh, is representable as a uh, tridiagonal matrix operation uh, or multiplication. Now let's figure out how to, uh, how to calculate that uh, funny uh, partial derivative uh, dq, d squared q dz dt. So we'll collect some of the complexity into a mesh function. So if we take q and we want to sample it at the uh, uh, the the x index, uh, you know, where x is a, here is an integer, uh, x times delta x, right? We want to sample it at that x value, and we want to sample it at the uh, z value, which is the integer z times delta z, and the t value, which is at the integer t times delta t. So I'm going to write the, uh, the t's as a superscript. That's not a, that's not a power. And, uh, and then I'll write the x uh, and z indices as uh, subscripts, you know, separating them with a comma. So um, uh, we uh, we then um, put that into a form of a vector by saying this is going to be this vector q with the the vector symbol over the top of it uh, is going to be uh, at a particular t and a particular z, uh, but it's going to be all x, right? So we have. Uh, you know, q at t and z is uh, is at z times delta z, and it's at t times delta t. But we don't say which x it's for because it's for all x. Uh, you know, all values uh, of the x integer here, the x index from zero to n. Uh, however, you know, however wide the 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 model is, the calculation area, of the data set. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to drop the vector symbol, okay, and uh, we're going to now. Using this uh, notation, we're going to try to take that uh, uh, difference, you know, first in um, uh, in z, and then another uh, difference uh, in t, and we're going to try to center that. Uh, so now the the you know thinking of the z the excuse me the x vectors is going into the screen. We're going to try to center the whole calculation uh, on this. Um, 
uh, on this this uh, point, you know, t plus delta t over two, or t plus half as I might call it, and z plus delta z over two, or z plus half. So you know, our q z t is really a vector, and it's extending you know into the screen here. You know, here is q at z and t. Here is q at z plus one and t. Here is q at z and t plus one. Here is q at z plus one and t plus one. And each of those is a vector going into the screen, which uh, you'll just have to imagine here for for a second. Um, so uh, we will approximate d squared q dz dt with uh, by taking this. Uh, uh, q at uh, t and z vector, and first applying the uh, finite difference, the uh, uh, the first order finite difference uh, in the positive direction uh, uh, and of t. Okay, so it's uh, d plus of t, and then the from the result of that, we then apply the uh, the positive difference in uh, the z direction. Okay, so here uh, you know we apply the the t difference, just the simple t differences we've seen. So it's q again. This is for you know, all x, right? Uh, q at, or maybe it's more proper to say for each x, but it's q at t plus one and z minus q at t and z divided by delta t, and then to that quantity we apply um, the d plus uh, operator in uh, z. So we uh, uh, we have then we pull out the one over t right that comes that constant comes right through the operator and so we have uh, q at uh, t plus one and z plus one minus q at t and z plus one all right minus the quantity q at t plus one and z minus q at t and z and all that is over delta z and as you can see it's all over delta z and uh, delta t. So we end up with four terms, which is what we wanted, right? We've got a first order difference in z, a first order difference in t. Uh, we've got q of t plus one and z at t plus one and z plus one minus q at t and z plus one minus q at t plus one and z minus finally q at t and z, and so that uh, whole difference is centered where we want it to. Okay, now for the uh, d squared q dx squared, we're going to approximate that. With uh, a uh, a uh, 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 you know again recognizing this is a vector in x right q is a vector in x uh, we're going to apply the uh, the dx minus and then the dx plus but we already know that's just one over delta x squared times the tridiagonal matrix applied to the vector in x of q at t and z all right so uh, T is our, uh, 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 just to remind you, it's our uh, tridiagonal matrix with side diagonals of 1 and a, uh, a main diagonal of minus 2. Now, uh, uh, you know, the, this side of the equation, this term then, the x derivative is going to be centered at t and z, while the d squared q dz dt term is centered at t plus half and z plus half, all right? So we want to center uh, also the uh, d squared q dx squared term by averaging over z and t. So this is essentially just the same crank Nicholson, you know, implicit method all all over again. Although you know we will be able to use this uh, explicitly. So uh, explicitly in, in t and z. So uh, the d squared q dx squared is is uh, um, is approximated. By uh, taking one over four delta x squared, and then uh, that's times the tridiagonal matrix, the one tridiagonal matrix applied once to the sum of these. Right, we're taking the average of all of the values here. So this is a little bit different um, uh, from Crank Nicholson because um, it's like we're taking the average first before we apply the uh, the difference. We're not actually taking the difference four times. Like with the first Crank Nicholson method, uh, so you know we're averaging together q at t and z, and q at t and z plus one, and q at t plus one and z, and q at t plus one and z plus one. So here's our total, you know, finite difference equation, right? Uh, uh, this is still in terms of derivatives, right? Q at z, 
q sub zt is equal to minus v over 2 q sub xx. And what we have here now is uh, on the left hand side for the uh, d squared q dz dt, we have 1 over delta z delta t uh, times the quantity um, q at t plus 1 and z plus 1, and then minus q, and this is just uh, q at t and z, all right? That's uh, uh, just t there. And then minus q at t and z plus 1, and then plus q at t plus 1 and z. And then on the right hand side, we have minus v over 2 times uh, 1 over 4 and 1 over delta x squared, and then times the tridiagonal uh, uh, matrix operating on this vector, which is the sum, you know, it basically just summing at each x uh, value. Uh, the uh, q's at t plus one and z plus one, the same, the same four vectors, right? Q at t plus one and z, uh, q at t and z plus one, plus q at t and z. So the differencing star kind of looks like this, and and I'm just uh, pulling out, you know, what what you use for one um, uh, one x value, right, to get uh, the, uh, uh, the the horizontal derivative, the x direction second derivative at uh, uh, at, at x, you know, whatever that, wherever that is, you know, somewhere between zero and n. Uh, so it's a three-dimensional differencing star. It's two in uh, z, two in t, and uh, by three in uh, in x. Okay, you know, first order derivatives in t and z, second order derivative in uh, in x. But you can see it lives in this three-dimensional space, so it's convenient to have that. Uh, Vector form, right? Remember, uh, in these, um, in 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 this uh, difference equation up here, all of these q's are vectors in x. Okay, so it's convenient to have this uh, vector form. And now let's be a little more uh, explicit about it. We'll collect all of the. Uh, uh, we're going to identify the differencing star. So we want to come out with an equation where we combine all the terms for each different uh, q vector, and uh, write a. Uh, uh, an equation equal to zero and identify the coefficients of each of those uh, uh, each of those vectors. So we have uh, we can collect all the uh, uh, all of the constants together into yet another alpha, uh, which is v times delta z times delta t divided by eight divided by delta x squared. So the uh, differencing star equation now setting everything equal to zero. Uh, the uh, and 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 here we can draw out the differencing star. You know, we're just looking at the at the ends of the vectors here. Uh, we're not we're not talking about the <clears throat> you know all these q's are vectors that go uh, back and forth in x in and out of the page. Um, but uh, we're identifying here the uh, the coefficients of each of the uh, uh, each of the different q vectors. So on uh, q at t plus one and z plus one, we have a coefficient. Which is, uh, as you might expect, the tridiagonal matrix times that alpha, and then you know up in the difference uh, equation, you know we just have one or minus one times this um, times this vector, uh, and we can't just add a, a scalar to a uh, uh, to a matrix and have that be a, an operator. We got to turn that into an operator. Well, of course, multiplying one times a vector is the same thing as multiplying. Uh, the uh, uh, mul operating on that vector by the identity matrix, right? The identity matrix is uh, is a matrix that's zero everywhere except along the di it's square, and it's uh, and along the diagonal of the matrix, it is uh, it is one everywhere else it's zero. So we have uh, then the tridiagonal matrix, you know, scaled by alpha, and then we add to it the identity matrix, which adds a one along the diagonal. And so this whole thing in the parentheses here is a matrix, you know, that I've underlined in green, and uh, and that becomes now a matrix coefficient in the differencing star here. Uh, so we have uh, i plus alpha t, okay, minus um, i minus alpha t, uh, and that's operating on uh, the q vector at t plus one and z minus i minus alpha t again. <clears throat> um, operating on q at t and z plus one, plus i plus alpha t, 
which is operating on the vector q at t and z. So uh, you can see there's a certain symmetry here. Uh, there is a little bit of simplicity here, at least, where um, despite the, the three-dimensional nature of this uh, numerical calculation. Um, so we have the same matrix on um, uh, the same matrix uh, at uh, q at, at, of t and z, and and uh, uh, and uh, q at t plus one and z plus one, right? Same coefficient, which just happens to be a matrix, and then the same uh, the same ones at z plus one and t and z and t plus one. So uh, you know to solve for this this uh, you know here for the, the differencing star equation. You know, we decide how we want to advance the calculation. We'll use, even though it looks kind of like an implicit um, differencing star, it's uh, it's not implicit in the t and and z directions. So we, you know, if we can then, if we know any uh, any of these three, we can get the fourth. Okay. If we want, uh, you know, q at t and z plus one, that's how we're advancing the calculation. Then we need to get the other three. So you know, solving this equation here for uh, one of the boxes of the differencing star, one of the vectors, then it would be necessary to multiply the equation by the inverse of the matrix in that position in the differencing star. Okay. So if we wanted to solve for q at t and z, right, uh, this one, if we're advancing the calculation in that direction, then we have to uh, uh, be able to divide out, right. Um, Divide out the uh, uh, the matrix, which is I plus alpha t. Um, you know, still a tridiagonal matrix, so uh, still relatively uh, simple. You know, we know how to do the tridiagonal matrix uh, 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 solution, so we know we can divide it out. Um, but when does that uh, um, when does that make a stable calculation, and when when could there be instability? All right. Um, you know, even though they're you know nice, even, you know, fairly predictable tridiagonal matrices, we got to look at them a little more closely and see how invertible they uh, they might be. Okay, because we got to invert, uh, you know, one of these. Uh, we only have two different uh, coefficients here, right? But we got to be able to invert one of them uh, to advance our calculation. So the uh, you know the one we have to invert is i plus alpha t. Okay, so here is just a um, a look at what what i plus alpha t ought to ought to be lo looking like, right? Along the diagonal, it has one minus two alpha along the diagonal, and along the side diagonals, it's got alpha. Not drawn very well there, but that's what it should be. Um, and the other alternative is uh, um, i minus alpha t, right? The, the minus one doesn't matter, um, and so along the diagonal, the i minus alpha t. Has uh, one plus two alpha, and along the side diagonals, it again has alpha. So uh, uh, you know we can think back to um, linear algebra and our, our general uh, matrix uh, inversion theory. And if any if one of these matrices has any any possibility of a zero eigenvalue, then we won't be able to invert it. Okay, and that's how we'll get our, our stability condition. Right? If we if um, if we have trouble with that inversion. Then we're going to have trouble. Um, then we're going to have trouble with our um, um, with our with advancing our calculation, right? Um, uh, now, one convenient thing to note is that this alpha that we combine all our constants into is greater than zero. And if you look at the definition of it, right, delta velocity is greater than zero. Uh, they're all uh, scalars. Nothing's complex in here, um, right? We're working on. Uh, on wave propagation here, we got, we went directly. We find it difference directly to the 15 degree retarded wave equation. So we're we're not fooling around with heat flow anymore. Uh, you know the velocity is uh, greater than zero. Delta z has to be greater than zero. Delta t has to be greater than zero. Eight, of course, and delta x is greater than zero. And so of course delta x squared is greater than zero. So um, uh, fortunately. The simple tridiagonal structure of these matrices makes it easy to evaluate whether any of their eigenvalues may be zero. And uh, there's a, a theorem called the Gershgorn disk theorem. Uh, this is why you take math classes, right? So you can learn about things like this just in case you might need it. 
Um, and the, uh, the, the theorem says that the eigenvalues of a matrix are contained within the union, you know, all possible disks that are defined uh, row by row in the matrix. Okay? So you look at each row of the matrix, and, uh, and each row of the matrix is going to define a disk. And the eigenvalue of the disk in complex space is, uh, I mean, the, uh, the eigenvalue is contained within that disk in complex space. Okay, uh, so if the disk overlaps the origin, the, the origin of complex space, the zero point, then uh, you've got the possibility of a zero eigenvalue. Right? I mean, eigenvalues can be complex. That's no problem. Uh, even though everything here is real. Now, what about each row uh, defines the disk? The sum of the off-diagonal elements in a row define the radius. And the center of the disk is defined at the diagonal element. Okay, So the radius is the sum of the off-diagonal elements. The center is the diagonal element itself. Um, and since we've only got, uh, you know, it's a tridiagonal matrix, it's easy now for us to, you know, we, we already know what the off-diagonal elements are going to be. We already know what the, uh, what the center is going to be. Uh, so we can, we can evaluate this. So we've got a, you know, here's defining it in terms of, uh, of indices and, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and in, uh, indices and, and uh, equations. So we have some matrix A, okay, and uh, and it's uh, you know an element of that matrix is A at uh, row I column J, okay, uh, and the um, uh, A at I I right uh, is uh, is a diagonal element. Now there's you know you you may be looking at other uh, um, in other classes, uh, right? The the repeated index would imply a summation. That's not true uh, here. Uh, probably nowhere in this class. Uh, so uh, a sub i i that's the diagonal element. That's the center, and then the radius is the sum over all j all uh, uh, all columns, okay, um, along the row i. Uh, but for you know not including j equals i, right? Um, the uh, the radius is the sum of the absolute values uh, or the magnitudes of all of the uh, uh, all all of the uh, elements in that row. Okay, so we get a center, we get a radius, we plot that. Uh, you know, the eigenvalue is uh, lambda. Okay, so the eigenvalue space is this lambda space. We got real lambda, imaginary lambda. Uh, we get the center, we get the radius, and then you know here's a case where uh, there's this little air gap between uh, uh, the uh, uh, between the zero point and uh, uh, and the disk. Okay, so um, uh, that's um, uh, that's how we're gonna we're gonna look at this. Okay, so in our in our case, right, we've got these relatively simple uh, um, uh, tridiagonal equations, okay, and uh, tridiagonal uh, matrices. So uh, there's a green one and there's a red one, a uh, brown one. So the uh, the green one is i plus alpha t, the brown one is i minus alpha t. Okay. The center is uh, at the diagonal element, and that's uh, and that's the same for every row, which is kind of nice, right? So that's um, uh, one minus two alpha, okay, uh, for the green one, and the radius is two times alpha, of course. For the brown one, the center is one plus two alpha, and the radius is two alpha, okay. So here, just to uh, plot those disks in. Uh, uh, in the eigenvalue space, uh, real uh, lambda and imaginary lambda, um, we start with the green one. We start at a at a uh, center, um, which uh, which is at one minus two alpha, right? So one's there, and then uh, uh, the radius is also two is two alpha, 
right? So if we start at one and we go back to alpha, the radius, we're at the center, right? And um, and since the radius is two alpha, well then suddenly uh, the uh, uh, you know the disk touches zero, right? Because uh, um, uh, one minus four alpha is uh, is going to be zero for this one. Uh, so the this you know we don't we don't know you know it it for whatever you know matrix we have the value of alpha and all that. Uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe it will not uh, it, it it will not actually have a an eigenvalue that uh, that is zero, but it's allowed. Okay, let's look at the other one. Okay, uh, is that going to help us? All right, the one minus alpha t. Uh, its uh, center is at one plus two alpha, and the radius is two alpha. Okay, so you can see that for the brown one. There's no way it could ever uh, have a zero eigenvalue. All right, so the disk defined by the green one plus alpha t um, might include uh, an, a zero eigenvalue, while the disk defined by uh, and and by the way, these are you know there's as many disks as we have uh, you know samples in X right uh, rows of the tridiagonal matrix. Um, but they're all the same, right? So that's uh, very, very convenient. All right. So, so the um, um, but the brown disk, you know, it never gets past one. It never gets anywhere near zero, right? So uh, it it the brown one, the i minus alpha d cannot contain any zero eigenvalues. All right. So uh, it's guaranteed to have all eigenvalues lambda. Uh, with lambda greater than zero, okay, or absolute uh, magnitude of lambda greater than zero. Now we could probably define a condition, you know, on alpha so that the eigenvalues of uh, i plus alpha t are greater than zero. We would need, uh, you know, the the magnitude of four alpha to be uh, less than one, okay. Uh, in other words, uh, four times. Uh, excuse me. Uh, V the velocity times delta z times delta t divided by eight uh, divided by delta x squared would have to be less than one. But you know, so so that that could be used, but we don't need it, right? We uh, we have this perfectly good brown matrix that we we can always invert, uh, no trouble, and will not blow up our our system. So let's go back to the differencing star in this uh, in this z world, z going to the right and Time increasing down, and uh, with x extending into the uh, into the screen, and you've got um, uh, uh, the green ones on uh, at q uh, uh, applied to q at z and t, and q at z plus one and t plus one. So we don't want to invert for those. The brown ones, though, at, uh, for q at t and z plus one, uh, and uh, for q at t plus one and z, these we can invert. Anytime we like, and no problem. So now we know that um, the uh, the inverse to the brown i minus alpha t is guaranteed to exist, and so we can find now, uh, you know, using our tridiagonal solver, okay, we can find uh, uh, you know multiplying, uh, uh, you know, bringing out uh, the uh, the uh, the coefficient and the term for uh, the vector uh, q in all x and at t plus one and z, okay. Multiplying that by um, and that that is pre-multiplied by i minus alpha t. We then pre-multiply by i minus alpha t inverse, and uh, the i minus alpha t inverse times the i minus alpha t that becomes the identity matrix, okay. So we could just drop it if we wanted, and uh, so we have a solution then for uh, uh, q at uh, uh, z and t plus one in terms of you know the other three, right? Uh, and and you know this is uh, you know these would have to be the knowns. Uh, this is the uh, the the d. This becomes the d vector, right? Um, and uh, so it's uh, um, uh, in using the other three, which is q at t plus one and z plus one, and q at z. At z plus one and t, and q at z and t. 
Uh, alternatively, we could solve for q at t and z plus 1, okay, uh, which then is calculated and inverted in terms of a d, which is the other three. All right. So we can't find q at t and z without, or q at t plus 1 and z plus 1 without some restriction. But without restriction, okay, we can find uh, q at t and z plus 1 and, uh, or uh, q at t plus 1 and z. Now looking ahead, uh, what we're actually going to solve for is uh, q at t and z plus 1. That's uh, you know, how we're going to, that'll be a product of how we set up the problem. You know, what are the boundary conditions in x? What are the boundary conditions in z? What are the boundary conditions in t? Right? All that is uh, going to be an essential part of the setup of our, uh, of our computation. So um, uh, here's the, uh, the system we will solve. You know, not not writing it in terms of uh, i minus alpha t inverse, but uh, uh, you know the form that we use in our uh, tridiagonal matrix solution. So this vector here on the right, so that's our that's our d vector essentially. Um, you know, it's uh, i plus alpha t uh, times um, operating on q at t plus one and z plus one plus q at t and z, right? Uh, and we can compute that for every x, right? These are still all vectors in x, and then minus uh, i minus alpha t uh, up multiplied by uh, q at t plus one and z, right? So that results in a vector. Here we have a tridiagonal matrix, right? We know all about that, and our our uh, r tries dot uh, c, uh, right? All these uh, you know all these coefficients are uh, uh, are all real. So our tries dot uh, Java will uh, give us uh, solve for uh, you know at, at every x q at uh, t and uh, z plus one, thus advancing the calculation. Okay, so uh, this this is a complete you know physical domain finite difference solution to the fifteen degree retarded wave extrapolation equation. It's going to allow us to downward continue, and uh, so to complete the migration to complete the imaging. What do we need else? We need an imaging condition, um, and it's the imaging condition that we'll use to get our retardation. All right. Um, so um, uh, let's let's look at that. Right. I mean, as before, we're going to use t equals zero, but we've got to put everything in retarded coordinates. So bring it back the primes for a moment. Um, we have. Uh, uh, you know the retarded t prime is equal to t plus z over v, right? Uh, so time is not uh, time, right? It's uh, it's it's retarded, and then uh, we have z prime equal to z and x prime equal to x. So at t equals zero, all right? You know that's and that's the the unprimed t, right? T equals zero. That means that t prime is equal to z prime over v. So we have this uh, slanted imaging condition. In retarded coordinates, and and I'll, and I'll show you you know a plot of what this what this looks like in just a sec. Um, so the um, the uh, the the t prime in, in retarded coordinates uh, is um, uh, is uh, really a, a slanted solution, and, and how is it slanted? Well, according to the velocity. And so if velocity changes with z, well, that's no problem. If velocity changes with x, that's that is harder to uh, set up in this particular situation, uh, although it, it, it can be done and, and has been done. Um, so, uh, uh, and we're still, you know, uh, everything else is the same. We're using uh, zero offset data and we're assuming the exploding reflector model. Okay, so now I need to go to notes uh, 27 to pick up on the, uh, uh, the end of the story here with the time domain. Uh, migration, uh, and and you have, um, I've given you as part of, um, it turns out, uh, lab nine, uh, I've given you a uh, program called uh, tdiff, which is a time domain diffraction, uh, which of course is just the inverse of migration. Um, and and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, both of those codes. Um, you know, if you want to and we have time uh, at the end of the class. We can we can work on uh, uh, you know changing that uh, tdiff dot Java into a tmig dot uh, dot Java. So um, 
let's see, I need notes 27. All right, the um, first page of notes 27 is 124. We're continuing on the uh, uh, time domain uh, uh, migration and diffraction. Uh, and uh, so here I'm going to draw out for you um, what uh, where everything is in our uh, in our data set and how we're going to make the calculation proceed. You know, our field of calculation. Okay, uh, time going down just like the original data. Okay, and and you know it's t prime, right? We've we've brought back the primes just to make sure we know we're in retarded coordinates. Uh, and um, the data are in uh, x and t, right? But x is equal to x prime and t is equal to t prime. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, that's not true. But uh, at z equals zero, um, uh, which is our data, t is equal to t prime, right? So uh, that's that's no problem. Our our data is just hanging in here with these values that are the brown um, asterisks. Um, and and you know below some some time at, at some you know t is increasing down right at some at some time you know there's no more reflections in our data or you know and and this is true of all reflection data sets I mean uh, we can't see anything it's all noise before that so we might as well just put zeros there below our data set we'll put we'll put this row or this uh, this uh, floor of zeros here. Okay, now we're looking. We're looking at vectors. We're looking at the heads of vectors here. These vectors are in x. X is pointing into the screen, and that's the same as x prime. And then uh, we have z here, uh, which is z prime. Okay, so our uh, you know this is this is just the same as the downward continuation. We will find our um, our data uh, on the xt plane. And we will find our image, our, our migration, on the xz plane. But because this is retarded z and retarded time, you know, at t equals zero, right, which is supposed to be the top plane here, uh, it's really uh, stepping down uh, and going to greater t prime as we increase z prime, right? Uh, and the uh, the kind of step um, coefficient is is dependent on the velocity so here uh, you know this is very cleverly set up so that um, the velocity is equal to Delta Z over Delta T I mean how convenient is that um, but uh, that's you know just for illustrative purposes uh, and 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 here you know we made the velocity one so that uh, we can go from uh, um, we can go from uh, um, uh, you know, just climb the stair steps, uh, you know, one at a time, uh, and you'll see that in in the uh, the tdiff uh, uh, .java program that that uh, I give you that the uh, uh, the step is uh, is two, you know, velocity is equal to two, uh, and which means that delta z is twice uh, delta t, okay, and that's the image plane. So we we need to start with the data, okay. And we also have this floor of zeros, right? Because there's no data after uh, after a certain point. There's no data below the bottom of our of our recording, right? Greater than the maximum time of our recording, and we just need to fill in the area, you know, with more vectors. Uh, fill in the area in uh, 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 in between. Okay, so we need to start uh, over near the data, and then extrapolate up to the image plane. Fill the image plane, and then we're done. Okay, so we are solving for q at t and z plus one, which means in the uh, differencing star that is the upper right corner, and um, that's uh, um, so we need to start somewhere where we know the uh, the lower left and the uh, and the t and z and the t plus one and z and the z plus one and t plus one. We need to start uh, somewhere like that. Um, so uh, uh, and then we can we can fill in. Okay. Now uh, clearly in this in this calculation area, um, 
uh, or even arena, if you want to call it that. You know, here's a place where we have all three defined. Okay, I mean, we don't know much, right? These are these are all zero. These whole vectors are zero. There's because there's no no data after a certain time, uh, big T. Um, but we at least we we have three known vectors here, and we can find. You know, with one run of uh, of R tries Java, we can we can find uh, uh, this vector up here, um, and uh, so then just looking at the ends of the vectors, right? The first one we would find would we would number one, right? Here are the asterisks are the data. The purple is the uh, is is the uh, um, the image plane, okay? Uh, and of course, at zero time, right? Uh, the zero time Sample in the data is already on the image plane, so you know we don't have to change that. Um, and so uh, you know we have um, these three here. We get this one, and uh, then you know then we would have these three here. We could get number two. Then we'd have those three. We get number three. We have those three. We get number four. We have those three. We get number five, and we have gotten the lowest vector, the lowest row. Uh, the deepest row on the image plane. Okay, and then we, you know, wrap back uh, to uh, uh, to the left side, and we know these three here. We could get number six, and so forth. And at number nine, in this simple scheme, we 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 get to the image plane, um, and likewise at number twelve, we get here. We get the image plane fourteen, fifteen, and then we're done. Okay. Uh, so this this uh, this scheme is looping first in Z. The inner loop is over Z, right? We we do a we do a uh, uh, an rtries Java run, um, you know, every time uh, to get every one of these vectors. But that doesn't take that long. Um, you know, it just takes three times n x operations really. Um, so uh, this is fairly quick, and um, we get uh, uh, and, and so uh, you know after in, in this simple case after fifteen runs of R tries, we have all five vectors along the along the image plane. Okay, so obviously this is a very small data set that I'm illustrating here. Uh, so the outer the inner loop is in Z. The outer loop is in time. Okay. Uh, we can do it the other way around too. No, no harm in that. We can have a z outer scheme, right? Uh, both are solving for the same uh, the same upper right element, right, of the differencing star. So we still start down at the bottom with the data and the zeros at the end, um, and we get this one. But then we have these three. Number two, we get. You know, we're climbing up in in time first. Number three, we get. Notice we're coming from the bottom, right? Looping back. Number four, number five is in the image plane, right? And then we have these three. Number six is here. You know, eventually we get we have you know three, four, and eight, and we get nine. Uh, and then uh, we start back down here again. Okay, that's a Z outer scheme. So we're looping the inner loops in time. The outer loop is in Z. Okay, now uh, what about the inverse operation to migration? Uh, which is diffraction, okay, and that's the program that I give you. So, at least uh, whatever I say here, you can go and check and see how I do it in uh, in uh, uh, tdiff.java. Okay, we can uh, uh, just as easily extrapolate from the image plane, right? Uh, T prime is equal to z prime over v to the data plane. Okay, we just need to use the lower left corner. Of the differencing star, which again is one of these brown ones, right? It's the i minus alpha t instead. Uh, so it's it's still just as stable, okay? Um, and so uh, our tridiagonal system is uh, um, the tridiagonal matrix is uh, i minus alpha t, and uh, we're solving for q at t plus one and z. That's the lower left one, and. Uh, <clears throat> And that uh, is equal to uh, this, uh, you know, data vector of the three that we know, okay. And that is uh, <clears throat> uh, that is um, q at uh, uh, that is q at uh, 
uh, t plus 1 and z plus 1 is a known, q at t and z is a known, q at t plus 1 and z is a known. All right, and uh, the uh, so now we, we put our, our image data along the purple area, the, along the uh, uh, along the uh, 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 the image plane, and the image plane is a little slantier than it was in the uh, in in the first examples I used, um, because it's uh, it's delta t is equal to uh, two times uh, two times delta z uh, for uh, efficiency. So so you know. Uh, uh, Velocity is equal to two here, so the image plane is is steeper. All right, so we begin by uh, knowing uh, uh, these three. Right, this is just the lower part of the image plane, uh, and and you know this one is duplicated here. Right, we you know with this you have to have some scheme of of getting these overlapping elements, uh, and and you know usually our delta t's and delta z's are very small. Um, and, and highly numerous, so uh, we uh, we don't have to worry about that too much. We can just copy them. So we know these three, and we can get that one. And then in a z outer uh, scheme, uh, we uh, we uh, we wrap back up to uh, the uh, earlier time t right t is still ha hanging down, um, and we get number two. And then we know these three. We get number three. We know these three. Right, we know three, the data, the uh, image, and one. We get four. And then we wrap up, and uh, you know, after getting to nine in this particular scheme, we have the data along the uh, time axis. Okay, so that's how that uh, code works. And now I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes talking about uh, side boundary conditions. Um, and maybe I shouldn't. Okay. So uh, the next uh, uh, the next lecture uh, is going to start at uh, uh, in uh, notes twenty seven, page one twenty six.